Hi, and welcome to another episode of Sand Hill Road, the show where I talk to successful startup founders and venture capitalists about the companies that they build and invest in. And the goal, like always, is to give you a sense of what it's like to be in their shoes, how their businesses tick, and sometimes take a bit of a technical deep dive. And today I'm super excited to be joined by Matthew Fornacciari, who is the CTO and co-founder of Gremlin, which is a pioneering startup in the space of chaos engineering. To really understand what Gremlin does, we first have to understand a little bit what chaos engineering is all about. So I personally first heard about chaos engineering when I read Antonio Garcia's book, The Chaos Monkey. What is a chaos monkey? So imagine you have a chimpanzee rampaging through your cloud data infrastructure, wrecking havoc left and right. And this is exactly the kind of software that Netflix developed in 2010 when they moved to the cloud. The aim was really to test the system's stability by enforcing failures through the pseudo-random termination of instances and services. The Chaos Monkey's system resiliency tool, which was later open sourced by Netflix, really became the precursor of a whole range of resiliency tools known as the Simeon Army. But even more so, it became the precursor of a whole new discipline of cloud computing and systems architecture known as chaos engineering. And the goal of this new discipline is really to experiment with software systems that are in production in order to build confidence and resilience into the system's capabilities. And Gremlin is really one of the first startups to offer chaos engineering on a SaaS, or as they call it, failure as a service basis. So the company has almost raised $27 million so far from some of the best names in the valley, including Amplify Partners, Index Ventures, and Redpoint. And before raising the seed round back in 2016, Matthew and his co-founder Colton had actually worked on this chaos engineering problem space at some of the largest tech companies out there, including Netflix, which is obviously home to the open source Chaos Monkey project, the largest cloud provider Amazon, and Salesforce. The company then went on to raise 7.5 million Series A back in 2017, led by Mike Volpe at Index. And last year, the company was able to close their 18 million Series B, which was led by Tomas Tongos at Redpoint. So I'm super excited to have Matthew with me today. So let's jump right in. Uh, I'm really excited to be joined today by Matthew. He's the co-founder and CTO of Gremlin which is a pioneering startup in the chaos engineering space. Before we dive into the product and into the company, I want to spend just a few minutes talking a little bit about your founder journey. So Matt, you are part of this very rare breed of founders who, who had the luxury, I, I would like to say, of having worked on this chaos engineering problem space for, for quite a while, for, for some years with your co-founder Colton at, at Amazon, where you're part of the the Fatals team, and then Colton moved to Netflix, which obviously has pioneered the space with the Chaos Monkey. Tell me at what point in this in this corporate environment you basically caught the entrepreneurship bug and thought that you would take the leap out into into the cold and and um, <laughs> and, and hard world of, of entrepreneurship. It's a nice way to put it: the cold and hard world. Yeah. No, uh, you're 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 very correct in that. You know, we were lucky to have already. You know tried this out at some of the larger corporations. Uh, you know, we, we wrote this at Amazon and Netflix and I did a little bit of work at it over at Salesforce. And honestly, you know, the whole idea of diving into the entrepreneurship wor world was a lot of just a conversation between me and Colton being like, Hey, I think we could in fact build this in a generic way for everyone. I do in fact think everyone could, could benefit from this practice, you know, and chaos engineering is in fact, you know, a practice. It's very much the same as you would write unit tests or regression tests. Like this is very much like something you should build into your, you know, development life cycle. And that's, that's sort of what we did at Amazon and, you know, figured eventually, you know, once people kind of catch up to, you know, the juggernauts of Amazon and Netflix and, uh, you know, Google and whatnot, they'll, they'll need this practice as well. So we decided to take a little bit of a leap. Um, it's it's never easy, I guess I'll say. You know, it was definitely leaving a very cushy job for the both of us. But uh, you know, you, you get the bug a little bit, and you you gotta just you gotta take a chance. So I listened to to a podcast where Colton talked about this decision of bootstrapping versus taking VC, and so 
you are also part of a very rare breed of founders in that you actually raised a seed pre-product, transitioning right out of the corporate world into a, a VC-backed startup. And I think there was this discussion with Colton and a venture capitalist at a conference where he basically talked this through with him. And I think Colton has five kids, so obviously they're the bootstrapping route would have been much tougher. So I was just wondering what the conversations were like um, at, at this stage. When you, when you got five kids, it's a little harder to bootstrap. Uh, I, uh, I luckily am not in that route, but um, you know, there's there's actually always trade-offs, right? Like that's that's part of the industry, right? You have particular trade-offs, whether that be te- technological wise or or whatnot, but. You know, we could have gone, um, you know, the bootstrapping route and just sort of tried to do this on our own. Um, I don't think we would have gotten this far, frankly. Really, what you get by raising money is you get sort of a, a you get a network with you as well, and that's super helpful, especially in the early days with respect to, you know, getting recommendations, getting introduced to people, figuring out, you know, who should who you should be talking to even, you know, we've been able, we've been very lucky in that, you know, the people we've raised money from amplify index, um, you know, red point, they've all been fantastic in terms of like increasing our network and increasing the people that we are able to talk to, increasing the number of people that we're allowed, that we can bounce ideas off of, you know, like, and so, yeah, we could have absolutely bootstrapped and, you know, what you trade is really ownership of the company and, Frankly, you know, I, I, I'm willing to trade a little bit of a trade a little bit of the company for some some ideas from some people that have been there and done that. You know, it really helps to to be able to 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 bounce ideas off of people that you know have seen this yeah. come by. Yeah, we're, for we're, sure. We're, um, we're both first uh, first round founders, right? So absolutely, you know. the first time at the rodeo is, is always the hardest. So so um, exactly. let's let's talk about the first days. Um, so you've raced. This, this seed round in 2016 from, from Amplify, you've got the money in the bank. So, so how were the first days? I, I imagine that you just sit down together and, and really like work on the product 100, 100% of your time. Or maybe you, you were already hiring people, testing the market. Walk me a little bit through these early days of, of, of getting right out of the gate with, with a seed round, suddenly put in this position of being an entrepreneur. Yeah, totally. Um, I mean, first days are POC, they're MVP, they're get things out the door, you know, make something workable. Um, and, you know, I, I love, I love that you say, you know, just sit down together. I wish, I wish that had been the case. You know, I'm in San Francisco, he's in San Jose, he's got five kids, he's got a family. You know, I'm, uh, I'm not, I'm not trying to go to San Jose every day. He's not trying to go to San Francisco every day. So it was actually a lot of really remote from the beginning, which is actually sort of like seat of the culture for our company where, you know, we're actually 52% remote right now, which is, Mm -hmm. you know, we don't like to discriminate based on location, but the other days were a lot of just cold and myself back and forth design patterns, you know, trying to figure out, you know, how do we, how do we actually make this work? And, you know, trying to espouse our three core product principles, which are safety, security, and simplicity into, you know, our original product. And that started with build a CLI. Let's just, let's start there. Start easy, build a, you know, a command line interface. Cool. Now let's build an API. Let's talk about, you know, we'll talk about the the technologies involved with that later on down the road. When we actually get to it, we're just building the CLI right now and then, you know, build the UI on top of that. And neither of us are designers or uh, UI engineers. So the, the first UI was a little rough at best, but, you know, you do what you can to get, uh, to get by and to really be able to get out there and, and be able to start to sell. And, and, and actually, one of the, the funnier things I think about us uh, in our early days, our early sales, is we both read motorcycles. So you would uh, see the two of us roll up to the company and be like, all right, cool. You want to buy this. Believe me. <laughs> thing. So it, was, uh, it was definitely interesting. Founder-led sales are always crazy, you know, outside of that. So in terms of hiring, uh, we... We went through a couple of people. We hired somebody in Germany, you know, as one of our first hires. Turns out, time difference, really difficult. Mm -hmm. Uh, He ended up opting out. Uh, We hired somebody in Canada that also opted out uh, after, you know, being with us for a little bit. But uh, actually, our first hire, and still one of our better ones, is uh, 
a guy by the name of Phil, who we found off Angel List. It's uh, it's interesting where you go in, in sort of your your first days, you know. And and so I think I imagine at this point you were used to this really sophisticated cloud infrastructure from Salesforce, Netflix, Amazon, and obviously these large companies are light years ahead in terms of running Kubernetes clusters or Hadoop instances. So how did you pitch at companies that might not have a sophisticated enough infrastructure for the value of such a chaos engineering system to kick in? And, and how, were, how were these really early sounding rounds before you had validation of, of the product? Yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, you, you ask, how did we know? Like, we, you, you never really know something <laughs> up in the early days. You know, it's a lot of kind of trial and error. Um, and I, I think a lot of that has been, you know, honing our messaging. Um, anytime that you're creating, you know, a, an entire category, there's a lot of education that goes into it. And so we, we worked a lot with, um, you know, what resonates with people, you know, what, what are people actually looking to do? How do they need to prove value? Like how do they set up the chain? Right. You know, one of the, the biggest sort of like pushbacks we got in the early days was, you know, we'd be like, cool, well you do this controlled chaos and they're like, oh, we've got plenty of chaos as it is. Why would we ever do it on purpose? Right. You know, and so you know, a lot of it became, well, would you rather do it at three in the morning or would you rather do it at three in the afternoon when you, you know, it's on your own terms and you've got caffeine, you know, coursing through your veins and that sort of thing. So all of the messaging actually uh, evolved over time. And, you know, it really helps that Colton and I were both, you know, SREs at Amazon back mm -hmm. in the day. That That really gives you sort of that that feeling of what people are going through and allows you to sort of like build up that grassroots, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. mentality. But honestly, unless, uh, you know, we've got three kind of qualifying questions, you know, do you measure your downtime? Is that downtime associated with a dollar value? Mm -hmm. Somebody own that. And kind of before you can answer those three questions, you may not quite be ready for chaos engineering. It takes, uh, it, it takes a concerted effort, okay. you know, so, um, so maybe let's let's dig a little bit into the product itself. Sure. So, chaos engineering it sounds like a fun exercise in a way. You you break things, you break them again until they stop working, and then you fix them and you break them again. But obviously, you want to break things carefully and make sure that that you can revert to the prior state. So, walk us a little bit through the architecture of Gremlin. So, the way we built this out is a little bit different than the way you know we built things at Amazon and Netflix, etc. You know, the idea is that everything is very locked down. We build out like a compiled binary. It's very safe, you know, safety, security, simplicity. I mentioned these. These are our core components or our core, our core tenants uh, when we're building things out. So the way we do it is actually by interacting with OS level operations, right? So we actually go and interact with, you know, tools that you already have on your, on your Linux box and, and use those to basically impose the impact but every single impact that we impose we have a rollback for mm -hmm. right and the rollback is is really i think it's the thing that was ne neglected a lot you know especially you know netflix introduced like chaos engineering and like a random just throw stuff out there and see what happens i think that's a bit of a misnomer you know like you really want to do it in a very controlled and careful way um and so yeah, that, that's sort of what we do. We, we built out, you know, a compiled binary, built in Rust, you know, the memory and, and CPU footprint are tiny. You know, it, it's a, an agent that sits on the host and it interacts it's with, a, you know. It's a, it's a, De it's a Debian um, pack, package, um, the, the agent that sits, sits on, on the host. Yeah. Yeah, we're actually, and we're actually extending that, uh, you know, what, what's available to uh, Windows and AIX this year. So we're actually building out, you know, more support based on OS, you know, you get definitely a huge different with, difference with Windows, but even AIX, which is, you know, a Unix-like system is uh, a little different. So we're working on uh, expanding our sort of footprint there and, and making this sort of available to everyone. But the idea is if you're going to build something that can break stuff, you know, be able to build, you know, the reverse back into play. So you can do these things with sort of competence. So the way I understand it in the beginning, you were building this, this core Gremlin chaos system and then you built this UX, basically this, this control plane um, on top of it. How was this, this process in terms of like development? Um, what was the, the first feature set that you built and then how basically, how did it 
evolve over time. We're very engineering centric in the sense that like we built mm -hmm. out the atomic building blocks first, right? So we built out the CLI first, and then we built an API mm -hmm. that it communicates with and they can control everything through. Then we built the UX on top of that, but everything is API first, right? You know, as a, as engineers coming from the Amazon and Netflix days, you know, we build the API as sort of the, the you know, the, the, the word of God sort of thing, you know, where you can, everything goes through there, you know, whether it be UI or not. But we also believe very strongly in simplicity. And if you don't make things easy, turns out engineers won't use it. So UX is really, you know, sort of layered on top to combine a lot of the API calls to make things okay. easier. But we've actually seen a fair amount of API adoption, which is, I mean, that's amazing. You know, we've actually had a couple customers white, white label our site just to, you know, make it a little bit easier for their engineers and whatnot. Okay. Yeah, that's sort of the idea. And then, you know, we, in terms of like what we've built out for the product, like attacks are the atomic building block of what you get mm -hmm. from Chaos Engine. We're actually going to be releasing something in the near future called Scenarios, which add in a lot of the metadata around that where, you know, you can specify a hypothesis, you know, an outcome, those sort of things. So you can actually like track your progress over time for a particular experiment. We build the smallest building blocks first mm -hmm. and then we things at the top of that. Ma you know? Makes a lot of sense. So let's talk a little bit about the the Docker's uh, container and Kubernetes container orchestration system and how Gremlin fits into this. I, I, I think I read that that Gremlin can also be run on a, on a container and, and is, is really well integrated in, into that um, infrastructure. I could imagine that for a lot of these these customers where the value kicks in, that's that's exactly those kind of cloud infrastructures that they're running. Uh, so the way we actually attack containers is by attaching sidecars to these containers that are running and then, you know, being able to like splice their network or, you know, share their, share their, uh, you know, their disk space or something on storage, something along those lines. But, um, the way it works is <laughs> frankly, the, the way it works in sort of like a higher level is people don't really actually understand containers and, and Kubernetes just yet, you know? Like, especially Kubernetes, you know, like Kubernetes is supposed to be the be all end all for, you know, all container, everything, a management, you know, the silver bullet. Um, but it actually, it, it has a lot of very interesting sort of quirks and, you know, making sure that it's actually doing what it's doing when you expect it to is very important. So that's sort of what we're trying to allow and enable people to do is be able to make sure that, you know, what they expect to be happening mm -hmm. is actually happening. Right. So whether, you know, you expect a pod to die and, and just spin up new ones, like make sure that actually happens. Right. But um, Kubernetes in general, we're a little I mean, I'll just I'll be honest. We're a little uh, a little uh, lax on our support mm -hmm. for it now. Mm -hmm. We're actually building support, you know, in the, the coming months for, you know, particular replica sets, pods, namespaces, services like make it much easier to actually integrate with Kubernetes natively. Mm -hmm. There is uh, I would say that it's it's still a very new technology that requires a lot of experimentation uh, with people that are migrating to it, and we want to be able to make them comfortable about it. So last thing about the, the product, what I was wondering was what are the kind of customers that, that it is built for? And you mentioned this a little uh, with the three questions, the qualifying questions. On, on your website, you have these e-commerce examples of how the downtime minutes really translate into, into dollars lost in revenue. So would you say that, that it's really e-commerce or? Yeah, it's an absolutely good question. Um, I mean, it, it, frankly, it's anybody who wants to make money on the internet. That's my, uh, <laughs> that's my opinion. You know, It's anybody who has a footprint, a significant footprint on the internet. But um, you know, those, those three questions obviously help a lot. And e-commerce, it makes a lot of sense to them. You know, every second that we're down, we lose X amount of money. Um, but honestly, the target market is, is anyone. You know, the, we, we very much believe that this should be a part of like the development life cycle, the same way that you build in, you know, unit tests mm -hmm. and, you know, integration tests, like regression testing and, you know, resilience testing should be a part of your development life cycle. So, you know, what happens when CPU and memory are pegged? What happens when I can't talk to this particular service, et cetera? Um, those, those should be things that engineers think about, especially in this, you know, 
new age of microservices everywhere. And, uh, and the way that you sell is basically through through trials and these experimentation sessions that you that, that you do with clients, where you basically sit it, together with the engineering teams, or or how is that process? Yeah, no, so we run game days, like the way we do it right now is our success team will actually sit down with a potential customer and run a game day. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had, I've been fortunate enough to uh, fly out and uh, sit with a couple of these teams and see them actually be like, well, this is what we expect to happen. Oh, shit, that didn't happen even remotely, right? You know, like very much eye-opening sort of uh, things around like, well, this is our expectation. We've never actually tested it before. You know, we expect to be, you know, be able to fail over if US East one goes down. Oh, that didn't happen even remotely, right? You know, we just we basically ate all the traffic, right? So it's very interesting to see people be able to, to specify what they want, you know, what what their expected outcome is. they test it. it. It harkens back to my, you know, early days of like dealing with the uh, the scientific method and whatnot. You know, I was definitely one of those nerdy kids in high school who was very into, you know, was very data driven and was very like, cool, well you say this is going to happen, let's test it out, you know? So uh, it, it's very interesting to see, you know, some of these companies and they're big companies, you know, and it's not just e-commerce, you know, we've got airlines, e-commerce, fintech, uh, you know, we've actually started to, to get, get into sort of like the medical space, mm -hmm. you know, when medical fail, ooh, even a bigger problem, right? So, you know, it, it, it's it's everybody has a footprint and everybody's interested in, in making sure they're a little bit more resilient. In the last part, I want to talk a little bit about scaling and failures along the way. And, and as a failure as a service company, I have to ask you really, what were some of the moments where you thought, well, this is just not working out and I'm, we're, we're going to hit rock bottom and where you had like self-doubts maybe about yourself, about the company. I'm not sure whether there were any moments from the outside, it looks like you're hitting all your milestones, but there might have been some moments where, where you had some uncertainty and, and I want to dig a little bit into those. Yeah, no, never, never, never a moment of doubt. No, starting a company, yeah, it's super easy. There's, you know, you never, you never think about it twice. No, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of uh, times where you're like, oh God, I don't know. Maybe this, maybe this was not the right thing to do. Maybe I should go back to a nice cushy, you know, corporate job and whatnot. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't think there's any particular moment where I thought it wasn't going to work. You know, I've been, I've been, I would say particularly fortunate, you know, in that Colton and I, we get along really well and we've had a lot, we've had some, you know, we've butted heads like heads on a couple of things, but like I've heard of some really horrendous, you know, founder stories and we've been very fortunate that, you know, we, we tend to be on the same page for a lot of things. And I think that helps a lot. I don't know. Early days, you know, we were told we might be a little bit early to market and, uh, you know, we, we, Well, you know, we basically told them like, yeah, right, we're gonna we're gonna kill it, don't worry. But um, you know, there's a lot of like education that comes with that. And so, you know, there are a couple of times where I've been like, maybe, maybe the world isn't ready for this just yet, you know. As we've kind of gone along, I think I think the world has kind of caught up. You know, we, we talked a little bit about it, you know, a couple of minutes ago, but it it does. It it takes a bit of education and it takes a bit of people kind of catching up to to where, you know, the juggernauts, Amazon, you know, Google, Absolutely, Netflix. Yeah building a little bit ahead of the, the market, actually. So now that you've reached scale, I think you have almost 50 employees or even more. I'm wondering, what is it that keeps you awake at night at this point? Yeah, that's it's a great question. It's funny. I ask uh, everybody I interview, you know, what keeps you awake at night? What, what gets you up in the morning? Those are the two, my two kind of, don't don't tell anyone, but those are my two, you know, my <laughs> kind of like, you know, cultural questions. But uh, what keeps me up at night now Uh, it's twofold. One is very technical. One is very much, you know, are we ahead of the game? Are we making sure that we're ahead of the game in terms of security, in terms of, you know, safety? You know, if, if we were to screw up anywhere in terms of safety or security, you know, our, we, we lose our customers' trust. And our, our customers are really, you know, that, that's obviously with a lot of companies, that's sort of your bread and butter. But like, With, particularly with sort of chaos engineering, like you can cause an outage. You can cause an outage for, you know, your customer in production and that that reflects poorly on their brand. And that's that's something that really keeps me up at night is how do we make sure that we can make this as sort of like foolproof as possible when people start to experiment a bit more broadly, right? And a lot of it is education. A lot of it is building things into product, you know, that sort of thing. So that's one thing. And the other thing is just... <sighs> I don't know how many you know founders you talk to about this, but culture, 
you know, culture as you grow and, and build the company, especially now that we're in a growth phase, mm-hmm. is tantamount. You know, like it's it's incredibly important in terms of continuing to attract the right talent. And I, I actually, I tell a lot of people this as well, but, you know, we just hit our three-year mark in January, end of January. And, you know, I wrote a nice little note to the team and I was like, kind of like, cool, well, we built, you know, a fantastic product. We built an amazing sales and marketing, you know, engine. But really what I'm most proud of is this, this team, you know, and being able to have everybody be just thrilled with coming to work every day and working on something that they really care about and that they're really passionate about. And that's uh, every single time you hire somebody new, you change that culture just a tiny bit, yeah. you know, it's keeping it, keeping it as kind of close to the, to the vest and as close to, you know, what you want is uh, you lose the ability to do that after a bit of, after a while, right. You, you kind of set the groundwork, set the, you know, the cultural values and whatnot, then you, you kind of see it, grow from there so and i i imagine it's especially challenging given that you're a remote company right well it definitely doesn't make it easier i'll say that much <laughs> um yeah we're 52 remote right now and uh you know we fly everybody out every now and then for uh you know different different meetings but like you know three years ago it was eight of us in one you know, one airbnb at reinvent and you know we we could very much uh control sort of like what people were thinking and how we talked about things and whatnot. Now we're, I think we're actually about to creep up to like 65 and like 52% of that is remote. Yeah. A little bit more difficult to, uh, espouse those values. So, so we try to do a good job with training and bringing people out when they come on board, but yeah, it's difficult. So thank you so much, Matt, for, for giving me the time and where can people find you and, and learn more about you and, and Gremlin and learn more about chaos engineering in general I, I saw that you had a conference organized recently. Yeah, totally. Um, so we, uh, we're, we're hosting a conference later in the year, like you just said, Chaos Conf. So chaosconf.io. Um, if you want to learn anything about, you know, chaos engineering or reliability in general, you know, it's, it's a particularly interesting uh, sort of SRE-centric uh, conference that's coming on later in this year in San Francisco. And we're, we're thrilled to have it, uh, you know, grow about, eightfold this year from our last year our, our inaugural year so it'll be amazing we've got fantastic sponsors and, and whatnot so it'll be it'll be awesome we're really looking forward to it um beyond that you know i'm on twitter uh barely but i'm on twitter at call me forney you know other than that we, we've launched gremlin free to sort of democratize the practice and we're trying to launch a bunch of different tutorials and whatnot so gremlin.com slash free Super helpful if you want to learn something about chaos engineering. Wonderful. I'm so excited and looking forward to following your journey. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time as well. Thank you. So this is it for today. I hope you found it useful. Gremlin is a super exciting company, I think, and I'm really looking forward to follow their journey. And if you want to hear more about what I'm up to, you can always subscribe to my newsletter on sandhillroad.io or just subscribe to the channel and tune in next time. It's up to you. Cheers, guys. Yeah.